want to whisper in your ear and tell you that I'm here and take you to the dance and maybe find romance but you can't so it's mob town life I want to see the friends I miss or give my mom a kiss or get my hair cut right or just sleep through the night but you can't so it's mob town life mob town life will drink with you forever mob town life in dark and stormy weather mob town life what else is there to do that's right then pandemic together so put on your wednesday best at least the top i guess will take you to the moon it's live to your bedroom it's tonight and it's mob town live Town Live is sponsored by Fair Elections with generous support from Late Stage Capitalism. <laughs> Welcome back to Mob Town Live, everybody. How are you all doing? Hello. You can't respond. I keep forgetting. <laughs> <laughs> uh, my name is Sarah. I'm Hannah. Uh, and we are coming at you live from the Mob Town Ballroom, uh, a arts venue in Pigtown in West Baltimore. Uh, and I imagine that some of you are tuning in for the first time today because we have some really amazing guests. Mm -hmm. um, so we're just going to give you a quick rundown of what this is. Uh, Mob Town Ballroom usually has all sorts of events throughout the week, um, ones where you're in person together uh, to try and keep up morale and support local artists. We've been having a weekly live stream. And the way that it works is that we have various guests on the show. Some are interview style, some are presentation style, and some are musical guests. Um, their payment information is going to be up on the bottom of the screen. So if you're one of the lucky people who still has a job, uh, send money in the direction of our guests who are out in the city doing really incredible work, and most of them are largely impacted mm -hmm. by all the various shutdowns. Mm -hmm. um, also, for those of you who are regular watchers, uh, this week is our second to last week in this season. So next week we're going to be having a panel discussion with small business owners around Baltimore City. Uh, and then we're going to take a three-week break and come back in September with a huge bill of awesome performers. Some people I've recently heard back from are Ursula Ricks. She's going to do a show. Oh, cool. uh, Joe Keys is going to do a show with the Late Bloomer Band. Um, so we've got some top-notch things coming your way. So keep a lookout for that. Yes. And today we have some Top notch content as well. Tell you a little bit about it. We have Greg Morton, a local historian, who's going to tell us about his home and also uh, a Baltimore landmark known as Douglas Row, uh, a set of homes built by Frederick Douglass. Uh, and we also have an international star <laughs> coming to say hello and to share some music with us on Mob Town Live. Pakistani singer songwriter Zeb Bangash will play. Uh, for us an exclusive Mob Town Live set. And then pretty soon, we'll be interviewing council president and future mayor of Baltimore, Brandon Scott. Shall I read? Yeah, let's just dive right in. Let's so do it. Let's hear about Brandon Scott. Yes, yeah, so Brandon M. Scott is the 21st council president of Baltimore City, and he is the Democratic nominee for mayor of Baltimore. As a proud Baltimorean, President Scott is a graduate of Mervo High School and St. Mary's College of Maryland. I hear it's a lovely school. Uh, president Scott has been 
focused on improving Baltimore and is dedicated to making Baltimore a city where every Baltimorean can live, learn, earn, and play, no matter their zip code. Awesome. Uh, Council President Scott, are you with us? Hello. I am. I am. I am. Good evening. Good, Good evening. evening. Hi. Nice suit. Good You're evening. You're looking slick. Thank you. In my memorable blue and gold, as always. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you so much. I like it. I look, I, I'm ready, I'm ready to, to be de-suited and get into my athletic wear, but I'm ready when I'm done with you guys. Well, we really, really appreciate you being here. Mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, yeah, I know. So I know this is a little more... Um, casual than some of the normal well, gigs that you have that. coming out and speaking um, Amen to that. <laughs> <laughs> um so all right let's just dive right in uh why don't you go for it hannah me yeah wow we're gonna dive right in okay all right cool mm. one second mm. sarah i'm just i got it I'm you're sorry. the so you're the youngest city council president so far and you're our presumed mayor i presume hope to god i presume um, it's hard for many of us to imagine what the day-to-day -day life of somebody uh in your position looks like but now especially with COVID 19 and all the shutdowns could you just like give us a rundown of what you did today before you came here oh wow so first things first no two days no two hours no two half hours or five minutes are alike before COVID. so imagine that uh exacerbated now. So today I started off early, early this morning, 5.30 with my normal dog walk with, with Sir Charles of Baltimore. I tried to get a little bit of, of peace in mind through some music, through some physical activity. Had board of estimates this morning, uh, uh, which is, you know, a, a weekly occurrence on Wednesday. Sounds had like a, a party. With, yeah. <laughs> had a meeting with one of the council members about some policy stuff and things moving forward. Actually had a bunch of, of Zooms a Zoom meeting with people, you know, everybody from residents to business leaders, religious leaders. I spend a lot of time on virtual meetings these days. Mm -hmm. And I and let me be open and honest. I'm an extrovert. I love to be around people. The hardest part for, for COVID-19 for me is that I have to talk to people that I can't see, that I can't touch, that I can't hug, that I can't dap. Spent, I spent the last several hours between Zooms. I had a couple phone interviews with press. I uh, had a, one small uh, in-person meeting with uh, some individual community members who I've known for quite some time about some issues in the community. And then I came to you guys. And when I finish with you, I think I have one more Zoom before I'm able to, you know, eat dinner uh, uh, and, and try to relax for a minute before I do my nightly reading. Yeah, I got to be honest. I would not be here if I were in your position and had been in on Zoom all day. <laughs> so I really appreciate it. Um, that said, so we're uh, a bit, I'd say, tastemakers in the community uh, <laughs> and uh, people. Sorry, that was a joke. And um, but our fans are huge, huge supporters of Bill Henry. I mean, they memed him. They're into it. I'm curious. Um, why do you deserve the same attention from our viewers? Well, you know, Bill is my brother and Bill and I, <laughs> we sat next to each other uh, for my first four years on the council. We tell a lot mm. of jokes. Uh, and I love Bill, and I know Bill, he makes uh, great drinks, but uh, Bill doesn't have some of the other talents that I have. <laughs> I would say that, you know, I may just be slightly more handsome than Bill. I tell, <laughs> tell, tell better jokes than, than Bill, even though Bill is a funny guy. Uh, I would say he would be he would be the Eddie Murphy to my Richard Pryor, if you're talking about the joking ability, right? If you want to compare it. But... But my, 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 my athletic talents and mm. uh, uh, my talents around music, I, am, I used to be a DJ, and my musical taste and ability to uh, put music together, uh, I think is what puts me over the top uh, from and why I need the hearts of the Mob Town Live crew uh, just as much as Bill. <laughs> mm, perhaps, that was a really good answer. Perhaps we should have a DJ battle between you and Mr. Henry one day. <laughs> I'd be very fascinated. I, I would be very, I'm pretty sure Bill and I have the total opposite taste in music, so that would be, that would be if anything, it would be pure D comedy, that's for sure. Perfect for the show. So we have a question for you. Um, as the mayor of Baltimore is in many ways a management position, and uh, one's ability to be successful is largely predicated on this skill set, what is your management style, 
And how do you build your team? What qualities do you look for and how do you achieve your goals? Thank you. And I think this is something that is critically important mm. and something that I think we have to, uh, when you're in a position like mine, one of the most important things you can do is look back and see what mistakes people make. Uh, mm. Building the best team around me, not just for me, but for Baltimore is one of the most important things that I'm going to have to do. Mm -hmm. And this is what I tell what I tell folks when I look at first and foremost, I need people that care, that are dedicated and believe in a vision for a more equitable Baltimore uh, throughout the city. They, it, we cannot, I am not just trying to attract the big fancy name. I want people who actually want to who care about this city, who want to work, who want to break down systems, who want to build new systems. But I often say that being in a position like mine and ascending to mayor, uh, hopefully, uh, as we go through November and the, the general election that we're taking very seriously, is a lot like being a basketball coach, right? Mm -hmm. Or a football coach. And I always say there's two types of coaches. You have the Bill Belichick's of the world from, you know, that team that plays up near Boston who has to be the smartest person in the room at all times and it's my way or the highway and the players around the team, even though they're doing all the work, can get none of the credit and that's it, right? It has to be the coach's way. Or you can be like Mr. Harbaugh or you can be a Mike Krzyzewski and you can create an environment that you empower people who are the best at what they do. They're the best at public health. They're the best at public work. They're the best at policing. They're the best at zoning. They're the best at finance and economic development and allow them to cohesively work together as a unit under your guidance and your vision on how you're going to move the city forward into a better place. That's my style. I, as a leader, want to be challenged by my team. I am not above being challenged. I am not above being wrong, but I want people to feel like they can uh, Go out on the limb and try new things and be willing to do things because one thing we all know for sure is true in Baltimore that we can't afford to have things continue to operate. They have been for at least the 36 years that I've been breathing. That's the kind of way I like to manage and build a team and that's what I look forward to doing for Baltimore and it's also critical I want to say that and also professionalizing which is why I am going to bring the office of the city administrator a practice that exists in all the counties surrounding us and Washington DC and the city of Philadelphia, allowing the mayor to have a professional run the day-to-day -day operations of city government, not someone's friend or relative as we've had in the past. Mm -hmm. Yeah, wow. Cool. Mm. Next question. Thank you so, so much for that response, Council President Scott. So another question. You ran on a platform of reducing mayoral power, right? Um, one thing a lot of our viewers are curious about is this. What are your thoughts on how you will make the most, on one hand, of the possibility offered by this office while maintaining your commitment to limiting the power of that office? How will you find a balance there? How are you envisioning that? Because I think that's not something that a former mayor of Baltimore has explored before. That was a very yeah, dignified I, way of putting that. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I think that this is the reality, right? It, it wasn't just a campaign promise for me. It's mm -hmm. something that I believe in. If Baltimore is going to be the best Baltimore that we can be collectively, we had to change the system. That's why after uh, the primary was over, I still voted to support the council's ability to move the uh, move money around their budget in a few years. This is why uh, I believe in that because absolute power for one person is too dangerous and does not work. There needs to be checks and balances. And what I want to do, I'm still going to have an enormous amount of power as mayor, but it's not about me simply having that power. It's about me doing the right things, building the systems, making sure that we're making the investments in everything that we need to do, and having a, a legislative body and others who are able to check me when I make mistakes, because I know that I will make mistakes, right? No one is perfect. And that, for me, is about Baltimore. It's never been, my public service has never been about me and me having power. It's about how we can do the best for Baltimore, not just in, in something that's critical, something that we haven't seen in the past. We've had mayor after mayor after mayor after mayor 
who are thinking about, okay, what can I do in this term to get reelected or what can I do in this term to go to a high office? No, I want to put things in place that are best for Baltimore that are going to be there long after I'm gone and long after I'm out of elected office. That's why I believe in changing the system in the ways that we have. Mm -hmm. I, yes, I like that. Take apart the table and then build it back, build a new table together. Cool. Uh, shifting gears a tiny bit. Um, so s small businesses are closing all over the country. Um, and I think a lot more are about to be closing now that PPE loans have run out. Um, and a lot of us, I think, who run small businesses are working without getting paid to keep these businesses afloat. And the money that we're bringing in is going directly to landlords because the rent is the Im immediate first thing that we have to pay. Um, what's your plan for supporting small businesses considering the COVID-19 crisis? Um, do you support commercial, like pausing commercial evictions or any sort of um, rent support or, uh, or, yeah. And in addition to that, what, what about the people who can't wait until you're mayor? Yeah, I think that the, for the for the last point first, for the folks that can't wait till I'm there, uh, they should reach out to my office now. You can you see the social media tag, or just call four one zero three nine six four zero four, and we'll do all that we can do to help you. I think that one one of the things that we have to do is better advocacy. We have to continue to advocate at the state and the federal level for the governor and Congress and uh, the person that occupies the White House right now. He who shall not be named are, co are currently operating, and get them to understand that this. This is not some political fodder. These are people's livelihoods. These are people's businesses. These are people's homes on their minds when you're talking about the impact that this is having. And then also, as I said earlier on in the spring, figuring out what the city can do more, right? I said that we should consider tapping into our a rainy day fund to directly support our small businesses here in the city and figuring out how we can do whatever we have to do. From, from preventing evictions to preventing people from losing their businesses and closing their doors. And one of the critical things that we can do that is hear directly from them on the things that they need and the things that they believe the city can be doing better at helping them. So I would just say that out loud. Folks who have small businesses who are in that situation, let us know what you believe, right? It's the things that we should be doing, that we should be doing at the local level and advocating for at the state and the national level because you don't ask a, a, a doctor if the, if the medicine is working. You ask the patient. And when you're talking about business in, in the city, those who are running it, those who work there, they're the patient. Thank you. Uh, yeah, and we're, just for the people who just tuned in, next week we're on the show we're having a panel discussion with a number of small business owners mm -hmm. from around the city. So we'll be talking about a lot of those issues. Mm -hmm. Me? You? Yeah. Okay, cool. <laughs> sorry. Uh, sorry, we do this thing where when we're not on screen, we're trying to decide who's going to ask what question. Uh, but, all right, so after the Department of Homeland Security violated countless Portlanders' constitutional rights, um, what power do you have to prevent those things from happening in Baltimore, or what power will you have? Um, and if camouflage individuals come to the city with no identifying badge and start kidnapping Baltimoreans, will the Baltimore City Police Department arrest them? So a couple of things on this now. I'm glad you brought this up. One, let me just be very clear. I said to uh, out loud to President Trump before, and I'll say again, uh, that there are a laundry list of things that, that they could help, that the federal government could help with in the city of Baltimore. Infrastructure, small businesses, digital divide, housing, uh, uh, finding out where these guns that get trafficked into the city come from using uh, ATF and other folks. Sending uh, troops into the city to deal with unrest that doesn't exist is not on that list. So what I did last week was actually ask our city solicitor to look mm -hmm. at legal ways that we could prevent uh, uh, these individuals from coming into the city. We're still awaiting to hear back from her. I'm expecting to hear back from her. But I will also say that uh, we have heard, I've been reaching out and talking with our, our partners in law enforcement that they have not heard any inkling of this happen, happening. And it seems to be that, you know, he is just doing what he normally does and talks mm. with his mouth and not actually talking uh, in actuality or fact. But we will take whatever action that we legally can to prevent that from happening. And we saw today uh, that they are actually leaving Portland as well. So hopefully uh, uh, the smart people that remain in federal government 
have gotten a hold of, of Twitter fingers. Cool. Thank you. Hopefully. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So I have a question that has come up from some of our listeners um, oh, cool. ab <laughs> about a very, very, very long debate in American history um, regarding reparations for black Americans. Um, uh, they ask, do you support reparations for black Americans? And what do reparations look like for you in Baltimore, the city that passed the first redlining law? Uh, I think that, that well, the answer is absolutely positively yes. I was actually uh, discussing with some of my staff members recently that the one thing that I was disappointed uh, that wasn't uh, lifted more into this conversation about this racial reckoning that the, this, the country is going through right now is that reparations should be like at the top of that list. Uh, because if you're truly going to undo all those years of policy and practice and all the things that we've had to endure since uh, uh, my first ancestors set foot on this continent, uh, you have to talk about reparations. And mm -hmm. especially in a place like Baltimore, the birthplace of housing and redlining via legislation. What that means, I think it, it can mean a couple different things, a lot of different things. Yeah. Right? It means the ability, everything from dealing with education, you know, educational stuff, providing opportunities, it can mean payments, it can mean housing and direct ability for, for, for African Americans to, you know, have land and, lo and not have more, all of these different things. But what has to happen is that we know each and every year this, this piece of legislation to study that gets introduced and it goes nowhere, mm -hmm. it has to happen. And this is something that as we hopefully uh, unelect the individual occupying the White House right now, that becomes a part of the conversation moving forward of how we how the country can do that and what's the best way for them to do that because it can be different from different for different people right for me you know this is another topic that I think that should be at the top of their their, their minds and for me erasing my student loan debt and allowing me to go out and and be able to you know and, and my counterparts to purchase uh, a property and land and home would be a great way for us to have build that generational wealth that we want to pass on to those coming behind us that we haven't had because we're so far behind because of how we've been treated since we've been in this country. So I think that that conversation is long overdue and folks have to be awoken even more to understand why it needs to happen. It needs to happen now. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, so we have, we're basically out of time if we want to have you do the Sage and Sage segment with Michael, but I'm going to throw two rapid fire questions at you. One is simple and one's not. So not the simple one, or maybe it is, I don't know. You, uh, you helped lead city council to trimming $22 million from the Baltimore City Police Department, um, the budget for this year, I think, right? Yeah. Yes. Um, so what's your perspective on investing that money into things like Baltimore Crisis Response, Mobile Crisis Team, Baltimore Harm Reduction Coalition, um, other groups that support the mental health crisis or various other issues so that people who are armed aren't the first responders to serious issues? Like, what's your thoughts on that? Yeah, I think that, listen, I am, as I said before, I'm fully committed to reimagining public safety in Baltimore. Uh, that is just this is just the start it's also about how uh not just about how the city reforms and how we procure and give out contracts and figure out how we can better partner with people that are doing that work reimagining substance abuse issues in the city but it's also about how the city does these things differently itself and we're just at the beginning stages of this uh, we know that there's some a, a group of folks now who are seeking a grant and that i'm supporting on how we can do uh, this kind of work especially behavioral health responses and I look forward to very much so on how we can in my term really dig down into and start to do some of that work. That's awesome. Thank you. Um last thing, where do you used to DJ and did you end up making a playlist? Oh actually so oh man. I I, I my DJing was done mostly at St. Mary's. I actually <laughs> did on campus parties and actually I had a nightclub gig where I DJed on Friday nights at a place called Monk's Inn on Route 5 in St. Mary's that huh. I discovered when I went camping at Point Lookout recently. It's now a church. So, <laughs> so yeah, so awesome. uh, they 
they, they, they went from dropping it like it's hot to praising the Lord in that building. But, you know, <laughs> all this. And I did make a specific uh, playlist for you guys. I'm going to put it in the chat, in the yes. Zoom chat That's right so now. That's awesome. Talk Thank you. <laughs> the five, I think it may be six songs uh, that I am uh, currently on my current favorite songs. Uh, some old, some new. One uh, as recently as today is a song, a favorite song of mine, Rest in Peace. Uh, to Malik B from the Roots who passed away today. So mm -hmm. everyone should check that out. Make sure you guys share that on, on Facebook with everyone so that they can see uh, what the council president is listening to. Right <laughs> That's awesome. We will. We will. Well, thank you so much. We're going to let Michael come in here and uh, do a quick Sage and Sage segment with you, which for those who haven't heard about this, it's our sort of twist on an advice column where uh, we have questions from the audience that we pick one of each week and uh, Michael sort of thinks back through literature and religion and philosophy and activism and all that and calls on a couple of the greats to sort of say what they would likely respond to this question with. And so today we're including you in that. I appreciate you being willing to do that. And I just want to say one last thing, ladies. This is an official uh, issue, a challenge, a joke of challenge to future Comptroller Bill Henry. On oh, my time. God. Thank you. Ooh. Yes, we're going to do that. <laughs> That's such a good idea. Okay, joke off challenge. Everyone watching perfect. should go tag Bill Henry and be like, oh, you just got called out. It'll be or, great. Or have that he can have his smoke any way he wants. Or we can do a <laughs> versus like music challenge yeah that's well. exactly what i was thinking about <laughs> mob town live versus challenge yeah. jesus he's probably watched some of my versus challenges already he knows i'm <laughs> so he might be scared to do that <laughs> awesome well thank, thank you. you so much thanks so we're much we're gonna hand thank it over you. to michael All right, City Council President Brandon Hello, Scott. Nice, nice to talk to you. It's a real honor, although I am, I have to admit, a Bill Henry man, and and you have yet to prove yourself. Uh, but I, I look forward to the battle. All right. So this is Sage and Sage, a segment where we're going to ask you to take off your politician hat and engage in sort of rampant speculation and theorizing. You ready okay. for the question? Yes, sir. I'm gonna read it. Then I'm going to toss out a thing, and then we're going to toss it back and forth, and then we'll just end. Uh, okay. Serious question. It goes like this. As the coronavirus pandemic has persisted, I've noticed a growing wave of apathy and defeat among Americans. To many Baltimoreans, that feeling isn't new, as our city has been struggling with systemic racism for decades. When we have reasonably lost trust in our government or lost faith that we have any power to affect change in our own lives or the lives of others, it's hard to get trust and hope back. To someone who has been told that if they do the right thing, those are quotes, their lives will improve, only to have that proven to not be true over and over again, it seems only natural that one would stop buying into society altogether. When I read this, I thought to myself, this is classic, like the answer to this is classic Marxism via Werner Sombart, who talked about late capitalism, where you in fact had develop a system that makes no sense and is filled with... Uh, paradoxes and, and, and sillinesses like we're experiencing right now where we want everyone to go back to work, but we actually don't want them to work because they should be inside, not getting coronavirus. Uh, and it, it drives one insane. And the answer is to rise up and have a old fashioned revolution. That's a uh, Karl Marx. The, the long game there would be, I think the, the famous Greek proverb that a civilization flourishes when you have old men planting trees, the shade of which they will never enjoy. I'm sure politicians talk about that all the time. Uh, yeah. Getting they towards something have, like that. Go ahead, go ahead. Most of them don't. They, and I always talk about this, and I actually preach this uh, when we're at uh, young elected officials or local progress. I always say to the younger elected officials is that things are, are very popular and sexy when you're in office. Like, for example, everyone talk about racial equity now. But if you don't put that in the law, when you're gone, it'll be gone. You have to make sure that you're putting things in place that are going to exist long after you're gone and that you won't 
reap the benefits from when you're in office. That's the true mark of a leader, someone who will do something knowing it's the right thing, but that they won't get any benefit from. And if we had more of those individuals, we wouldn't be. That's what pushed me into what I do. But, and also to your first thing, it's about when you feel that way, then you know what time it is. It's time to build a system. Go in there and blow it up yourself. Be a part of a group of people that want to say, okay, this isn't working. We're going to change it. So if uh, on my way here today, right, uh, the, the proverbial like squeegee dudes were out, right? And we're talking about somebody who's willing to take abuse all day long on a Baltimore City intersection to make money because presumably there's not an option available to them right now that is better than that. Uh, is, is that what you would say to one of those young people? that your job is to go get involved. How would that person get involved? Why should they not give up hope? How do we talk to them? Well, to, what I would say to those young people is what I say now. Let This is something I think that we also have to do. Let me reach down. Let me reach back. Let me do the human thing to do, not the political thing to do. Let me figure out what's going on with you and your family and your situation that's causing you to be here and try to help you. Let me help you grow that entrepreneurial spirit that you have and deal with all the things that you're facing in your life and do what so many people refuse to do for our young people and then get to know them. I think that often when we try, people try to solve people's problems, right? You can't go up, and I used to say this especially to individuals when I was running mentor programs and dealing with a lot of nonprofits. You can't just run up to these young men on the corner, young brothers on the corner and say, okay, uh, I want to be your mentor, your friend, fix your life, pick up your pants, take care of your kids, stop smoking, stop drinking, stop doing drugs all at the same time, right? Without doing the basic thing is, who are you? What's your name? How can I help you? What's going on with you? Like we have to humanize and be human and build relationships in order to help people and allow them to be helping in the fashion and the speed in which they're comfortable with because when you're dealing with uh, young people that are in situations like that, they often have been uh, hurt so many times by so many people. And we have to recognize that as we try to deal with the deep issues that we have. That was a great answer. Let me try to mess you up real fast and say, instead of sort of uh, that, so that kind of a soaring response that would apply to everyone generally, let's say you're talking to me, you know, overeducated, kind of privileged white dude, what am I supposed to do confronted with the despair that is earned in Baltimore City in the position that I'm in, which is, well, precarious these days, but still pretty good? Yeah, first things first. Uh, be willing to be uncomfortable, right? Go to places that you're not comfortable with. Get with people that you're not used to being around. Understand that that is real, not just from the sense of driving on MLK Boulevard and, and, and Washington, uh, uh, but actually knowing what they um, talk to them. Because I think one of the things that happens here in Baltimore a lot is that people see something and they see it at the surface level and they never do the tough work of digging down deep into it. Because I often say, I say it all the time, if I decide to go out and put on a T-shirt and some basketball shorts or in the wintertime a hoodie and stood out there with a squeegee, People wouldn't know me, know me any different than those <laughs> men that are out there, right? I look the same way, right? And in fact, you know, I used to wash cars growing up as, as, for a living. What if people thought, didn't think that much of me to allow me to wash that car? I wouldn't be here today because I wouldn't have been able to buy my school books. Be vulnerable. Be willing to be uncomfortable and understand your privilege and be willing to go outside of it to truly understand this, the system that we live in and the situations and be willing to use it to benefit the changes necessary because it will be greatly helpful. All right, last question before we move on. Uh, if you had to recommend one work of art, book, music, uh, painting anything that right now in our current moment in this city not america this city that everybody should check out what would it be oh i'm i'm gonna i'm i'm gonna go music i'm gonna go music and i am going to say that everybody everybody 
uh, in Baltimore to get a kind of a sense, and this is a is a hip hop '90s hip hop album, to get a sense of what's going on, that they should go back and listen to Thirty Six Chambers by the Wu Tang Clan, because it'll give you a sense of what the kind of life that young men and women growing up in Baltimore had to live. That's an extraordinary recommendation. You picked like the one 90s hip hop album I actually kind of know. So thank you. I feel good about myself. The, the one, really. Um, thank you so much, uh, City Council President Brandon Scott. It's been an honor for all of us, and we appreciate you coming on the show. And we also appreciate your future, like, horn locking with our hero, Bill Henry. We will. I, I look forward to defeating Bill in any way possible. <laughs> <laughs> Outstanding. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Peace. All right, we're going to bring up the fabulous Abby Becker to introduce our next situation. Abby, what have we got? Well, right, I'm Whew, let's all take a breath on that one. Yeah. That, was, that was exciting as hell. My giant forehead is sweating. <laughs> Abby, Abby was, that, was that you who got the mayor on our show? Well, you know. Oh. Um, it was. Everybody who's watching this, it was. <laughs> um, so, uh, again, big shout out and thank you to Council President Brandon Scott, our future mayor, for taking the time to come on our public access TV show, Mob Town Live. Thank you to all our returning viewers and our new viewers. I'm Abby. This is Michael. We're a couple of the crazy kids that put this thing together. And um, uh, I am here to introduce our next guest. Who Hashi is gonna let into the meeting because I forgot to do it, um, and um, we are so privileged to have her here. Originally from Lahore, Zeb Bangash is acknowledged as one of the most popular, distinctive, and authentic of voices from not only Pakistan but that entire region of South Asia. She is actually world famous and she sings in Urdu, Dari, I'm very sorry I'm going to butcher the names of these languages, Pashto, Farsi, Turkish, Punjabi and more. Um, she is featured in the soundtracks of Pakistani films. She, um, Some of you may know her from uh, her acclaimed duo with Hania Aslam and she is the first Pakistani artist to serve as the sole music director of an award-winning Bollywood film, Lipstick Under My Burqa, which was made in 2016, and I definitely want to check out. And she is here. She's recorded an exclusive set for us tonight. Uh, Zeb, are you, are you with us? Hi. 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 Hello and welcome to Mobtown Live. Thank you, thank you. I'm so happy to be here. Thank you so much. Um, I feel like you have raised our, you have single-handedly raised our exposure like 2,000 fold. Yes. Oh my God. <laughs> um, so welcome to Baltimore. When did you get here? Um, it's just been a month. I've just been here. Um, yeah, I think we, we came here in June, so. Uh, just a month. Awesome. And um, how, what have you been up to musically since, uh, as as someone referred to me, at, or, or since the apocalypse? <laughs> <laughs> you know, the apocalypse is not so bad for us creative types because we, we always like a little bit of um, time to ourselves. So, um, I mean, it was uh, as far the stress and thing of it notwithstanding, I've, I've, uh, I've really enjoyed the time to just reflect and uh, just be with my practice and all of that. And I was doing a lot of that during the first few months, just changing the pace and using that as an opportunity to reevaluate. But I think coming to Baltimore, this, there's just so much energy here and there's such a creative vibe here that now I'm kind of itching to get involved in things, you know. Well, we are thrilled to have you here. Um, and I, I want to give people a little taste of what you do. So maybe we could, um, and I know that you 
uh, re recorded these videos with a mutual friend of ours, Yoshi. Um, and so uh, postal service style, you know. <laughs> um, so uh, let's 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 check out a track, and and we'll come back. Yeah. about that song um yeah this is actually um uh, you know it's from the plains of um, india and pakistan it's a, a song uh, in the punjabi tradition it's a folk tradition um and it's basically a wedding song uh, about a bride leaving her home you know it's, it's about departure but then it also has like most things in our folk traditions it has very strong spiritual undertones mm. so that's why you know that it has kind of this bittersweet um a thing about you know this this life and the next life and that kind of uh, you know kind of transitions it's it's it talks about transitions so uh, kind of sadness about leaving something and excitement about uh, embracing a new world that kind of that's beautiful. Um, I would just want to uh, take a second to say that um, 
if uh, you have the means, please uh, send whatever you consider a cover or for this show to be to Zeb, um, because, uh, you know, as uh, working artists, you can't, there, you, you know, like no matter how tenacious you are, um, it's very difficult to be in the music industry right now. And so um, <laughs> right. we are grateful for this opportunity to be able to produce new material and um, we appreciate your support and being able to do that. And also to like the Mobtown Ballroom Facebook page. That's right, Hachi, so you can see more of our content in the future. Oh, um, she said it. I love it when they say that. <laughs> yeah, so, me too. I love that. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I want to know, um, can you tell us a little bit about your hometown and how, I know you are new to Baltimore, but how does it compare, compare to our beloved city? <laughs> um it's uh it's it, you know one thing that's uh so i grew up a lot i moved a, a, a lot even in pakistan but uh, the main city that i call home is lahore and one thing that um i find it's a huge city um uh, it's, it's the second largest city in the country and we're a very populated uh, uh country and it's a very culturally rich center of of the country um so there's that but one thing that i really loved about baltimore and i vibe with immediately was that we have uh, we have the rooftop culture you know where uh, people hang out a lot on their rooftops and they uh, you know it, it's not it's like regardless of which neighborhood you're on but everyone and sometimes in the summers the summers are very very intense kind of like what we're feeling here right now. And then people, to get respite, they go upstairs. And sometimes in the evening, they even sleep on the rooftops. Um, there's also, uh, so I mean, like, in many ways, I, I'm getting kind of, you know, uh, these resonances in Baltimore. The fact that it's so artistically inclined, the fact that it's, you know, that it has a real warmth to it. Um, it's uh, also like I, I like how people have a sense of humor here and that's another thing that uh, Lahore is very famous for like nobody gives you a straight answer there there's always something <laughs> there's always some something witty that comes out of their mouth so yeah I'm kind of uh, both um, being nostalgic about Lahore a lot these days but I'm really enjoying being here I'm actually strangely even feeling very happy about the heat wave right now. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you used the word intense and that's quite a generous word for um, for what I would call it. Uh, but I, I just need to channel some of that energy because um, I'm cold blooded. <laughs> um, can you tell us how you got started singing? Um, yeah, um, it was all really by accident, Abby. Like, I'm not from a musical family like that, but we have, um, in, like, I mean, in most uh, families, music is shared, you know, just amongst families and all. Uh, and my, my grandmother, she was a very talented singer, never professional, but so I grew up with um, a lot of music in the house. Every time we'd get together, we'd We'd have music and singing and I didn't realize till much later that I could sing and then when I was in uh, college in Massachusetts um, I think over our first Thanksgiving break my cousin and I we like made some songs just to kind of you know not feel homesick and she uploaded them on her on her computer and they went viral back home and so by the time I went back in the summers to uh, to Pakistan, they were being played on the radio. And so it kind of, you know, I didn't really choose singing. It just kind of chose me. And then one thing led to another and I kept getting work. And before I knew it, I was doing more music work than anything else. So that's the story. Wow, that's incredible. Um... Uh, so the next track that we have is Sanane. Am I? Uh, yeah, yeah. Sanane. <laughs> Sanane. Um, is there anything you want to say about that before we hit play? 
Yeah, um, I love this song because, uh, you know, it's a real kind of uh, fun, like retro track. And it's not a, an original. It's it's basically in Turkish. And it, it was popularized by um, Ajda Pekkan, who's this really like um, amazing pop singer. She's still performing and she's still going strong. And uh, it's uh, the song is kind of a, a song of emancipation. And it's it basically is pushing the world's judgments away. And it's a sana ne means what's it to you. Mm. So, you know, that's, I thought it'd be nice to, after the very like heavy spiritual song to lighten it up a bit. All right, take us away, Hachi. <laughs> Hiç rahat yok mu bana şu yalancı dünyada Kimin ne hakkı var ki karışır hayatıma Hesap soramaz bana kim çıkarsa karşıma Kimin ne hakkı var ki karışır hayatıma fun what can you tell us um what's that song about yes yeah, so this song this uh this song uh, basically it says um isn't it my life isn't it my heart isn't it isn't it what i want to do so why is all this judgment on me and if uh, and why don't you mind your own business it's 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 nobody else's business but mine my life is my business that's right <laughs> my life yeah. i like that my my life, my heart. Um, yeah. How many languages do you speak? So I don't speak as many languages as I sing in. Um, I speak Urdu. I speak a bit of Turkish, Pashto. Um, I can sometimes get by in, in Persian and uh, English. Wow. Yeah. So and and a bit of Punjabi. As so well. just a few, you know. Just a few. <laughs> no, no. No, but um, I can sing in mo- a lot more. Like, it's easier to sing in a language than to, like, you know. Mm. <laughs> um, yeah. Oh, 
I wanted to ask about the recording process. So how did you make these uh, these living room tracks? Yeah, um, it was actually quite uh, interesting because, you know, right now I have the, I, I did everything wrong. So I had, you know, I had it in a vertical when I'm supposed to have it in a, a kind of a, a, a landscape uh, thing. <laughs> but it was, yeah, I mean, it was, it was happening in like in three different countries because, um, you know, I had one person, well, of course, you know, she was making the tracks, then I was singing on them. Then I was sending, uh, I was sending the uh, editing to be done uh, somewhere else in New Jersey, and then uh, you know some of the uh, mixing was happening in one place, and some of it was happening in another place. So, yeah, it was all over the place. <laughs> I mean, and it was quite. I mean, for you, felt I felt quite nervous because it feels so precarious. I mean, you just have your phone and you just have text messages. You know, you're not sitting in the studio seeing the work happen. So um, it was a little uh, stressful, but it's always so nice when it comes together and it feels like such a feat, you know? Yeah, and it, we made it happen, you know? You, you, you made did. it happen. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, I wonder if you could tell us a little bit about your teacher, Master Sami. Yeah. So um, Ustad Sami, I've been training with him for the past um, six or seven years, well, eight years now, actually. So uh, he's, uh, he's in the, he does this uh, very old kind of um, Islamic um, meditative music, raga music. It's called Khayal. And uh, it's based on his family. They, it's all kind of linked to a Muslim thought and spirituality. And this is like uh, they created these. Uh, they created this. Um, um, these kind of groups of ragas um, by by taking by really like understanding music from all over the region. So from like you know Arab scales, Turkish scales, Indian scales. All of that, and he's a, he's the only living master who kind of works with and and uh, and and practices that particular kind of uh, of, of performance and and music. Um, uh, and uh, his his ancestors around 800 years ago wow. they helped formulate this particular art form. So I've been learning from him for the past, uh, you know, eight years or so. And it's been so uh, interesting because interacting with him, it's like, you know, I'm, I grew up in a city and I, 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 I grew up in the West. I studied in the West. I work all over the world. But like when I when I interact with him, it's literally like, you know, I'm I'm living with I'm, I'm learning with a living museum, you know, <laughs> like because the things and his perspectives on life and they're so different. So, uh, yeah, I mean, that has been a very, very important part of my training and also I think my personal development in the past uh, seven to eight years. And have you been able to keep working with him, uh, you know, being, you know, stuck in one country, like uh, quarantined the way we are now? Yeah, you know, so I, I am, um, this is one thing, uh, if I if I dare say it, that I'm very thankful to for for the lockdown is because uh, he was so opposed. To, he's opposed to most things that have to do with like too much technology. So he was so opposed to uh, coming on a Zoom call with me. But during the lockdown, he actually agreed. So now I actually have daily lessons with him, which is kind of lovely. So, oh wow! Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Um, I just have a couple more questions for you and then we'll play out with the final track. Um, but uh, the people want to know where they can hear your music. Um, what, like, where, where can they, uh, you know, how can they, how can we support you? Where can we buy your records? That kind of thing. Okay. Um, uh, there's always, uh, most of my stuff is on, uh, you know, it's online. Uh, but you can also join my Facebook page and, I'll do what you did. <laughs> Join us, like me, share, Gotta like, like it. share, subscribe. <laughs> I did it. <laughs> you did it. <laughs> I did that. I went there. No, but we all should. Um, Zeb Bangash, right, is where Zeb. we where we can find you and buy all your music and um, follow you. 
and keep track of your journey. Um, I think that what I actually wanted to uh, poach a question from Michael earlier tonight, who asked our um, incoming mayor, city council president, Brandon Scott, um, if you right now could recommend like one piece of art, a painting, an album, uh, you know, a book um, to people right now, like one, one thing that's resonating with you, what should we check out? Oh my God, it's going to be so obscure. <laughs> no, go for it. We love that. <laughs> um, something. I think, um, well, I've really been, I, I think I would, I would really um, recommend uh, that uh, you all should listen to some of this, um, this uh, uh, beautiful singer from Pakistan called to fail Nayazi. So if anyone is interested in listening to some really like um, uh, spiritually like, you know, enhancing music, that's that's one thing I would recommend. Yeah, if you can uh, type that into the chat before you leave, we'll uh, we'll pass that along to our to our viewers. Just to... Sure, sure. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you for that. Um, we have one more track. Uh, it's called Hami Nastu. Um, and I just want to thank you so much for being so willing and perhaps one of our most enthusiastic guests. And I really look forward to what it means for the city for having you in Baltimore. Thank you so much. I'm, I'm really loving being here. And it's so lovely to be amongst all of you guys and especially on this wonderful session. Um, such such brilliant personalities. So thank you so much. Thank you, Zeb. We love you. Love you too. Bye. Aminas, Hamias, to Hamias, to Mary John, it will have been saved. I Hamias, to Hamias, to Girlfriend, those Peru is a meas, a meas, to Hamias, to Mary John, it will have been saved. Hamias, to Hamias to
Just wonderful. Uh, I want to say thank you again to Zeb Bangash for sharing these three beautiful songs with us. Um, hi, by the way, Hannah here and Sarah. Um, I want to encourage everyone to drop some Venmo love to Zeb. Their information should be in the chat. It's in the chat and it's it was in the on chat. the screen so you could scroll back. Yep. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. And that was gorgeous. Thank you so much, Zeb, for your time. Uh, and the reason that we're so able to uh, have these people on the show is because of you all donating. So I really, really appreciate mm -hmm. it. Um, please remember to go like our page and the pages of all the people who have been on the show tonight and will be on the show tonight. Uh, and uh, also, if you're interested in contributing to the next season, to us upgrading our equipment and some of our tech stuff, the Venmo that you see at the bottom of the screen right now is money that will go directly to that. Feel free to go for it. Mm -hmm. um, all right, next up, we have this awesome dude on the show. I'm so excited. So I was at a party, a block <laughs> party, like a year ago or something uh, in Fells. And basically, it's the, a block that some of our friends live on. Um, they shut the whole thing down, and they all the neighbors come out and have a cool party Love together. a block party. It's very fun. And um, at this block party, I was introduced to this awesome person named Greg Morton. Uh, and Greg told us all about the house that he lives in and that block in particular, and it was like stumbling across an amazing historical gem. Um, so we're gonna we're so lucky because we're gonna get to uh, sort of see what Greg has going on at his house and hear all about the history of it, which I'm not going to spoil for you. But um, some stuff about Greg. Gregory Morton is a Baltimore-bred financial services professional, real estate investor, historical preservationist and art collector. Um, and through his work and investments, he explores the social aspects of personal identity as correlated with cultural representation and community. Um, his passions are vested in authentic engagement and aesthetic tastes, which foster both emotional and equitable connections. Uh, so I'm super excited. Greg, are you there? What's up? Hey, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate it. Hello, Greg. And I see you have greeted us with an image of Frederick Douglass. That's on the front of his house. Amazing. Yeah. Uh, so we're going to yeah, probably... that's the plaque that's nice and connected to the house. <laughs> yeah. We're going to ask you questions as we go, but I think you should just go for it, Greg, because uh, I... Because you're so charismatic and yep. know so much. And everybody, Greg's information, Cash App, Venmo, PayPal, all that is on the screen there. So please feel free to contribute to Greg for all that he's sharing with us tonight. Go ahead, Greg. What's up? Welcome to Douglas House. This is the front. Let's back it up a little bit. Oh, yeah. Nice flowers going on there. Okay. Oh, wow. Y'all got that out. Go into the house. So what is this house? So this house, this is a uh, Douglas house, right? And Douglas house is one of the five homes which was built by Frederick Douglas, which is known as Douglas Row. So Frederick Douglas was essentially a slave in Baltimore. He spent his formative years in Baltimore and he escaped from slavery um, from Baltimore. And uh, he became the well-known guy, the orator, and the statesman that we all have come to know and respect, but he was pretty much from Baltimore. And he had worshiped at a church uh, called the Strawberry Alley Methodist Church, which uh, he attributes all his successes to because he learned how to be comfortable in public speaking. And uh, when he became rich and famous and Abraham Lincoln's right hand man, he came back to Baltimore after he had accomplished all these things and he bought the lands which the Strawberry Alley Methodist Church once stood on and he erected five homes. And what you're looking mm. at now is one of the five homes that is now called Douglas Row. And mm. I have 
been able to acquire this home. I completely renovated this place and I've staged it with a bunch of artworks that I love and Looks amazing. Uh, I share with the rest of the community. What gorgeous art you have in your home. Mm. Yeah, so what, so what this is is, well, I'm an art collector and what you see here is a mixture of museum quality artworks as far as some of my own individual taste from artists that I've come to know and appreciate. And uh, you also see kind of a mixture of like furnishings, which is uh, kind of retro, vintage, uh, antique, kind of cool things that I personally love. So what happened was, well, I was able to acquire this home by the graces of God, like, holy crap, I was so surprised that I was even able to acquire this home. Um, I renovated it and I staged it with uh, works from my own personal collection. And because, you know, I'm a finance professional who kind of moves in and about the city of Baltimore, all the way up to like New York and Jersey and all over the U.S., um, I decided, well, because I'm kind of in and around Baltimore and I hear all the time, and this house is a uh, historic property owned by uh, a civil rights uh, leader and pretty much the father of civil rights, I thought that my personal pursuits in collecting artworks of the African-American perspective and diaspora, uh, well staged in the home, just kind of fit mm. so well. And I thought it would just be really cool to share yes. this property with uh, a lot of other people. So I started renting out my home as an Airbnb. Oh, shoot. And it kind of blew up, you know, like more than I expected. People kind of really wanted to see the works. They wanted to be in this historic property. And uh, I just allowed them to do so. So I essentially share like, you know, my prized possessions, things that I really love with mm -hmm. the community at large. Now, so Greg, I have a question for you about your home. Living with the work. Sure, what's up? So, two questions, actually. Uh, oh, I'm going to start with an audience question. Charlie asks, hey, Charlie, was that a Globe poster down there? Sure was, Charlie. You got <laughs> it right. That's a Globe poster. <laughs> if you know anything about the Globe posters, that was a Baltimore company. And the Kira Baltimore notes the Globe, uh, Globe posters poster company, well. they made all of the posters for, like, well-known bands of that time. And they pretty much originated this block print form that we see on a lot of the old antique and collectible posters. Hey. So this is a Baltimore company. And Micah at one point kind of uh, acquired their archives. So you'll see kind of reprints, but this is an original. Yeah, it looks like old we have school, the director real deal. of Globe. And you don't see very many posters like this because, <laughs> well, this one was uh, one that was for uh, a Christmas slash New Year's performance um, at the Fox Theater in Detroit, which is the Motortown Review. And they did not know that all these artists would eventually become like household names, very sought after. And they just threw them all in this one performance. Like, please support these artists. And <laughs> all like of a sudden, the all these guys kind of blew up. Amazing. And like, whoa. <laughs> so it turns out we actually, in our chat watching us now, we have, what, what was that, Hachi? What does Allison direct? I don't Well, Allison runs the Globe Collection at yeah. Micah. And she makes all of our posters for the ballroom. Uh, oh, where? Yeah, so hey. so we know all about Globe. It's incredible that you have yeah. originals in there. That's amazing. So next question, Greg. Before you purchased and renovated the house, what did it look like? What was the state of this house? I know so little about it. Well, all right. Let me uh, let me turn back around. So the state of the house when I first originally got it was it was in need of a very deep renovation. Um, it was kind of, hey, what's up, everybody? Hey. Hi, so, Greg. There um, you are. So what happened was this house was in need of renovation. Um, it was pretty much a shell. So mm. I bought the home, and uh, I did everything from top to bottom. So I did oh. a complete renovation. Okay. I added this nifty bathroom that's here. And then what you see, well, got to keep turning around my camera. But I added this bathroom here on the first floor, which wasn't here before. Okay. And I actually found the old school transom. So in Baltimore, you know, we had these stained glass transoms that was yes, quintessentially Baltimorean yes. in each home. And at some point in time, the original owner or owner at some point in time took it out of the, the covering that, you know, was above the door. And I found it in the basement while I was renovating the <laughs> home. So I used it as like a window feature and cool. built it into a bathroom, which I put on the first floor. So this home, um, it wasn't in terrible condition, 
but it was in need of like a lot of repair. So I just did the, did the do. What can you tell us about the rest of Douglas Row? And I'm thinking now, I don't think a lot of people like think of Frederick Douglass as like a landowner and like, yeah, why do house, you do that? Housing bill. Oh, you guys, that got it, oh you guys got it all mixed up. Frederick <laughs> Douglass was all about the black perspective, and he was about, you know, black prestige and honor and ownership. So Frederick Douglass, he was rich. Like, let's not get it twisted. Frederick Douglass, not only was he the father of civil rights from an intellectual perspective, but he was a rich guy. You know, he was strapping. He was very handsome. And he essentially took all of his winnings from being an orator and public speaking, and he wanted to invest in property because he knew that was a legacy that he could leave behind for his lineage. So not only was his legacy, his uh, political views, uh, it was also land ownership. So mm. he owned this property and the four properties next to it. He actually rented these out. These were rental income properties for Frederick Douglass wow. because at this time he also owned the mansion in Anacostia. He yeah. also owned a large sprawling mansion in Rochester, New York. And he also was building um, a large vacation home in, um, uh, 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 what was that? Uh, what's the area? It's, it's, it, it, it was called Twin Oaks and it's in Annapolis. Mm. Yeah, Annapolis by the waterfront. He oh, had a, yeah. a property in Annapolis in the waterfront, yes. which is a vacation home. So Frederick Douglass was all about property ownership and investing um, in black communities for the long haul. So he would rent these homes out to black Baltimoreans. Well, yeah. So here's the thing. What people may not know about Baltimore, Baltimore has a rich history of being a place where black people migrated to because black folks were doing well in Baltimore. So down here in Fells Point, you know, we had the import export coming off of the ships at, uh, you know, the Harbor. So, uh, there was a large migrant effort of black folks from the South up to Baltimore to become ship caulkers. And that was pretty much making sure that the ships were watertight, airtight, so they could traverse the seas with the cargo. And mm -hmm. to be a ship caulker, making sure that these ships were in good condition to traverse the seas, it was a skilled labor job. So you had to pre pretty much learn under a master. And if you knew how to do it, you were sought after from a, a employment perspective. So this became an industry that black folks uh, were very lucrative at and the word got out so folks from down south would migrate to baltimore to learn the ship caulking trade and uh frederick Douglass knew about this because he himself was a ship caulker before he escaped slavery so he created these homes as rental income for people black folks who were migrating from the south up to baltimore and the idea if you come to fells point and even in federal hill we have these little kind of small alley streets and the idea was like, well, you want to live near where you worked so you could literally get out of your home and walk a couple blocks and go to work. So here on Douglas uh, Row, which is now Dallas Street, it was called Strawberry Alley because it was named after the produce that was primarily coming from the shipyards um, on this block. So uh, they were pretty much shipping strawberries back and forth from this block. <laughs> wow. And Douglas was very uh, keen to what was going on in the migrant effort of African-Americans. So he had these properties for as rental properties for folks who were coming from down south. That's really cool. So it sounds like Douglas had, um, uh, like, I mean, obviously he had a very strategic outlook on how to get things done. When you uh, bought your house and sort of found, started investing on this particular block, how much did that, the element of black ownership and legacy and uh, keeping wealth in the black community play a part in your decision making well i'll be very honest with you right i kind of fell into this property serendipitously um i was already working i'm a finance guy so it's just like uh i care about investment for my own personal gains and then uh i'm a black guy and i kind of was already investing in artwork from an african-american perspective uh one because i just love the artwork and two uh, because there's a value associated with uh collecting cultural uh, representations of your blackness. So I was already doing that just naturally. And then when I came across the home, um, it was just out of the blue. I was like, oh, I couldn't believe I could have it. So um, I started to uh, essentially create the space for me to personally live. You gotta understand, I'm from Baltimore. I'm deep in Baltimore. My family's huge in Baltimore. <laughs> so I'm always coming back and forth to Baltimore and I just wanted a place to stay. So when I found this place, it was more for me as an individual and I stage it with my with things that make me feel personally comfortable. That's really cool. So it was 
it was after I had created the space, renovated it, and then staged it with my collection that I thought just how cool it was and that it was such an honor to have this historic home that I should share with people. And then it became something of an investment for, you know, some profit. But for the most part, I just do this for the love. You know, I think that folks should have an experience of being connected to this history of Frederick Douglass. And then the artwork of the African-American diaspora just fits well into that theme. And I just felt it was important um, and also an honor for me to be in a position where I could share this perspective with people. So I did it. Um, and that was it. You know, um, it wasn't contrived. It was very organic. I mean, it's really cool to see. I feel like at least I hear so frequently about some of the greats of Baltimore, like Chick Webb's home being like in ruins or like all these jazz greats and everybody like a bunch of civil rights leaders and the the houses being knocked down or condemned or whatever. Yeah, Cab Calloway house. Yeah, exactly. It's amazing to see you bring it back to life and uh, mm -hmm. sort of keep it as your own. It was built on the foundation of the church, right? Yes. So Strawberry Alley Methodist Church was uh, raised. And um, so Frederick Douglass had left Baltimore. He had escaped slavery and he stayed away from Baltimore because he was a fugitive and he wasn't very well liked in Baltimore. So let's not get it <laughs> twisted. You know, he was a fugitive and he became like this rich black guy. and People hated him. It was like, oh, my God, who is this guy talking all this crap? And he's from Baltimore. If he ever comes back to Baltimore, we're going to string him up. So he stayed away from Baltimore for most of his career. And then after he was very well settled, I feel personally that he had on his bucket list. Like, I'm not going to leave this earth before I go back to Baltimore and just walk the blocks that I grew up on. So um, when he came back to Baltimore, he, uh, you know, went to view all the places that he had frequented frequented when he was a youngster. And he wanted to go back and visit the Strawberry Alley Methodist Church, where he was a member. And he saw that the church was gone. It was raised. Now, nothing bad happened. You know, the congregation outgrew the building, so they moved mm -hmm. on. Um, so he was so sentimentally attached of his, to his experiences at the church. He was like, you know what? I'm going to buy the land that that church stood on. And then, you know what? I'm going to flip it. I'm going to turn it into something that's going to make <laughs> me some profit. And I'm going to build these houses. And that's what he did. So he was very forward thinking in that method. Um, but also, in my personal opinion, I think it was just organic. He just wanted to pay homage to something in his own personal life that gave him opportunity and personal, you know, uh, belief in himself like it, it, it raised his confidence and I think that he just wanted to have ownership of that and to share that with the next generation that's really cool time for another question go for it all right um well actually how much time do we have uh, we make the rules. I don't know. Well, we make the rules. Okay, we, we have got all the time in the world. We have a f uh, a fervent fervent request from the audience um, to ask for your art recommendations. You are an art collector in Baltimore. If you wanted to recommend a piece of art of any kind, book, music, literature, painting, photography, what would you recommend to our viewers? Okay, well, there's a couple artists that I'm, uh, I have a part of my collection who are doing very well now. Um, mm -hmm. So I collect uh, the masters, so like your Ramir Bearden's, your Jacob Lawrence's, uh, your Kehinde Wally's, you know, the folks that you kind of know their name. Like, oh, they're everywhere. But there's a couple up-and-coming artists who are just now kind of breaching the, the mold. Um, so you have Jamia Richmond Edwards, uh, who I have a piece, and I'll actually show it to you now. Lovely. So this right here is from Jamia Richmond Edwards, That's and cool. she's huh. a beautiful like artist. Like as a person and also her work, she kind of does this mixed media thing where it's hand drawn yeah, yeah. and painted, and also she does textile works. Um, she's very much emerging. I ran across her uh, first from Gallery Martise, and I just fell in love with her work, and she's doing extremely well right now. And then there's also Delita Martin. Lita Martin just had a huge show, uh, which is up, you know, at the National Women's Gallery in, in D.C. DC. Oh. And her works are really exploding right now. She essentially draws on uh, like kind of art fabric and then does this weaving, which is beautiful. She's getting a lot of notoriety now. So I would recommend her works. Um, and then from a book perspective, I'm really big on mindset. So currently I've been kind of looking at like, Napoleon Hill work. So obscure work for Napoleon Hill currently is like Interview with the Devil by Napoleon Hill. You can catch it as a book, but you can also find it on YouTube as an audio. 
and he talks about uh, all of the the changes in society that can be made. And he does it in the perspective of pointing out what's wrong with the world, what can be changed by interviewing the devil and giving you the perspective of like why things are misconstrued. Hmm. It's a very challenging book to read. But uh, if you read it and you get it, you'll kind of understand where he's coming from and you'll pick up points that will help you uh, in your in your pursuits. That's really cool. So if people want to learn more about Douglas Rowe or if they want to come stay in your Airbnb, how do they find it? Well, I mean, you can check my IG page. Uh, my IG page is douglas.house.bmore. Um, with Airbnb, I've kind of chilled off of Airbnb because we got the, the cough, cough, COVID thing going on. I mean, so I'm kind of yeah. kinda chill on that currently. But, you know, as things relax, I'll be opening it back up. Uh, so you guys can always check me on IG uh, and you'll get updates on this endeavor and then also the other kind of business ventures that I have going on in Baltimore. Which include, uh, I'm opening a retail slash art gallery slash oh, yeah. uh, maker space oh. right across the street from Remington. Oh, um, our house. So it's called the Cahoots Brothers. You can't miss it. It's right oh. across the street from our house. It's yeah, it looks good. Yeah, yeah, it's yeah, good. Yeah, it's good. Yeah. So we renovated called the Cahoots Brothers Trading Company. And it's a beautiful space. We'll be opening that up probably later on this month. Um, I've been looking at that for a while. I, I, my guess was like sausages, like high end sausages. <laughs> <laughs> uh, high end as long as we keep it high end well, yeah. the, the we painting is end. superb so it had to be high end uh, yeah yeah it looks yeah. really good when i've driven by so congrats on that that's really exciting um definitely Thanks, send us info about you opening so that we can put it out there to the people who watch all right definitely that's a bet that's a bet awesome well uh thank you so much greg is there anything else that you want to say before we sort of wrap up Hey, I just want to say, be more love. Uh, you know, I'm Baltimore bred. I'm from Baltimore. I'm your, you know, friendly neighborhood entrepreneur, venture capitalist. But I'm from Baltimore, and I'm deep in Baltimore. And my roots in Baltimore are for real. I love this city. And uh, I don't care what anybody says. Uh, this city has been beautiful and great to me. And the people who I frequent, you know, and the places that I frequent, um, it's been beautiful to them. So I really love this city. And uh, I just want to spread that message. The city is a great city. Agreed. Thank you. We are so here for that. Yeah. Thank you so much for being on. I really, really appreciate it. Everyone Deuces. out there, Love send Greg guys. some appreciate of your money. Love town. Love town. <laughs> All right. Bye, Thanks, Greg. Greg. Bye. Bye, Greg. We've had a friendly venture capitalist on the show. <laughs> yeah. I'll be. <laughs> I think awesome. Yes. Um, I love Greg. Uh, all right. Well, we're we're wrapping up, but I think we have time for top comments. Right? Top Damn right comms. We do. Let's do top it. Comments Damn from last right. week. So, as some of you know, we pick the best comments each week and we feature them at the end of the show. So, uh, you still got time to try and get on next week's show with your top comments. <laughs> um, Hachi, let's roll these. Charlie, <laughs> I love history. Wait, we did, know. Didn't he say that this week? Yes. <laughs> okay. <laughs> at least twice. <laughs> I remember this comment. Uh, yeah, Charlie, our a staff member here at Mobtown Ballroom, and, your husband. and my partner in life, uh, is uh, fiance. Is uh, let's not bring it up on the <laughs> live. Show. It's not my business. They're not announcing yet. Anyway, uh, that's him. He likes history. He loves it. Sorry. All right, moving on. Don't oh, the, I'm one. sorry. It's a new comment. Some. Christine writes, everything is food. This resonates with me personally, Christine. I wonder what you were talking about. Yeah, what were, what were, we were you eating? referring to? We didn't have food on the last episode, did I we? I don't remember Christine, what, where what are we did you? on last I week's show. I have no idea. Does anyone know what we did last week? <laughs> no. That's <laughs> a good question. I don't know. What day is it? I, uh, anyway. Wednesday, I think. We well, watched the teapot one. video, but that wasn't oh, yeah. food. <laughs> well, it, I don't know, it could have been. <laughs> All right, next. <laughs> oh, there it is. Oh, it is a nice teapot. It is a nice teapot. The Reddit comments on that one were pretty good. The one I found had relaxing music and not like trap hop, but um, they were talking. They say it's like 300 bucks to get one of those handmade teapots. Dang. Um, huh. I was 
um, thinking that maybe next to the video, we should have just like the string of text messages that I get from my mom during this show. <laughs> we can do that. <laughs> that would be funny. We, can, we and have then the, the technology. What the hell is happening when the teapot video came <laughs> on? Was <laughs> that was so funny. <laughs> Anna supports me. I like it. That I mean, was I support really funny. You. I loved that video. One, I love tea. I love teapots. <laughs> and my God, this the skill. The smoothness. You hear that? The Listeners, smoothness. Buy us a fancy teapot and we'll put it on our table that we definitely don't have to strike before mm. the show next week. These are such <laughs> polite top comms. We have a lovely show. Uh, oh, this is my <laughs> These mom. are all just well, leading right into each other. The transitions. This is my job, mom. Abby. <laughs> Am I supposed to be confused? That's uh, about it. That's the gentle version of the text message thread that I was receiving. And it's also about the teapots. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Mom. Good job. Thanks. This is from Michael. <laughs> Hello Kitty We're looking doesn't at Michael. have birthdays. She has anniversaries. I believe Michael was quoting somebody, um, but I like to imagine that he was just informing us. Oh, yeah. <laughs> we had Allison on the show last That's week. That's right. Uh, yes, Allison, and she was talking about the about Hello, Hello Kitty, Kitty type. Yeah. Awesome. Your, your mom's in the chat now. Oh, oh she's mad. She's getting on top comments for next week. That's for sure. <laughs> no trash and mom. Good Cindy's job. got an automatic end. <laughs> 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 Thanks for not killing us. Every mm. week. Uh, with what? In what way, I wonder? I don't know. And who? Mm. I think this is the first week she's not watching live. Oh. Yeah. Thanks for not killing us. Yeah, I just thought that was an appropriate <laughs> message for all of us in this time. I was about to say, I think this is something maybe... I was talking about give killing people with coronavirus indoors and mm. how we only have outdoor seating and haven't had indoor seating because we don't want to kill any of them. That's right. That's yeah. what this was about. Yes. So you're welcome, Rachel. This I is actually, a test of how well we can yeah. remember what happened one week I ago. I really can't remember <laughs> anything else. I like do I'm appreciate you guys for like staying closed and not having dances here. That'd be so, so messed up. Uh, thanks. I'm Speaking glad of not killing people, though. No dancing. Next, uh, next week's a ceasefire weekend, right? Is, that, is oh. that next week, I think? I hope so. I think so. That's it's cool. either this weekend or, or next weekend. Good know, they, to know. They've Look been, it they've up, been tweeting everybody. it up. Oh, yeah. I got to hit, hit the button. Do we have any more? Nope. Oh. Uh, nope. That's that was it. all our top all comments. Right. Charlie loves history again. A wonderful way to I end. Oh, Charlie. We know. All right. Um, so a couple quick announcements before I do that. Um, do we have a video? Oh, yeah. I, I slammed it in. Oh, not that one, but we okay, got another one. one. Okay, we cool. We got a backup vid. Well, uh, a couple things. Remember to please send some money to the guests from Chip tonight. Tip your bartenders. Mm -hmm. Brandon exactly. Scott, Greg, Zeb Bungash. Pay them. Absolutely if you incredible. Can. Um, if you want to throw some money towards next season, season to us, uh, like ramping up our tech, Mobtown Dash Live. Don't worry. Venmo. We won't get too good. Oh, yeah. It'll still have that charm. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and like and subscribe to both YouTube and Facebook for us. Um, and for those of you who missed the beginning, next week will be our last Mob Town Live of this sort season of Season one. The, of season one. Of the mm -hmm. summer. Mm -hmm. We're then going to take a three-week break and come back We're going with to the beach. an incredible lineup. And things will be slightly different, hopefully, in, in some good ways. We're going to make some changes. We got Ursula Ricks coming up. We got Joe Keys. I don't want to reveal too much more, but we have a bunch of things coming up in September. Um, so stay tuned for that. And we might take it on the road, too. Oh, that yeah, would be so not, cool. So if no, you have yes. land with a fiber internet connection, hit oh, us up. Oh, that's true, yeah. That, yes. Hit us up. Um, and next week, please tune in because we're going to have a panel discussion with a number of small business owners from around the city. Uh, talking about the issues that they're facing, sort of humanizing them, and uh, reminding you that small business owners are not corporations. Yeah, uh, this is super important to get a like an actual sense of like what the state of affairs is with small business owning Baltimore. This exactly. is relevant to all of us. We should. I hope we can all tune in. Because most of the fun things that you do, unfortunately, due to capitalism, require businesses, and the small ones are the best ones. Truth. <laughs> Uh, and apparently 70% of all economic activity in this country. I mean, that makes some sense to me. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you all so much for tuning in. Thanks. With that, this was Mob Town Live, and we will see you next week. Good night.
the car is on fire and there's no driver at the wheel. And the sewers are all muddied with a thousand lonely suicides. And a dark wind blows. The government is corrupt. And we're on so many drugs with the radio on and the curtains drawn. We're trapped in the belly of this horrible machine. And the machine is bleeding to death. The sun has fallen down. And the billboards are all leering. And the flags are all dead. At the top of their poles. It went like this. The buildings toppled in on themselves. Mothers clutching babies picked through the rubble and pulled out their hair. The skyline was beautiful on fire. All twisted metal stretching upwards. Everything washed in a thin orange haze. I said, kiss me, you're beautiful. These are truly the last days. You grabbed my hand and we fell into it. Like a daydream or a fever.